shoulder impingement, or subacromial oh, yeah. impingement syndrome. And I think there's a, a few reasons that are good why it's gotten roasted a bit. But in some ways, it's gone a little bit far. You know, it's like at the end of the day, what do you want to call your shoulder pain, right? Or what do right. you want to call your knee pain? Let's be real for a minute. Injuries suck. If you've been lifting yourself for any period of time, you know that if you push yourself long enough or hard enough, something is bound to crop up. Over my own career, I've had back injuries when I was competitively powerlifting, I hurt my knee skiing back in 2005, and when I was playing competitive sports in high school and college, I'm pretty sure I suffered from about every lower leg injury known to me. So injuries are part of the game. But here's the important thing, they shouldn't keep you out of the game. Just because your client or athlete is injured doesn't mean they shouldn't be in the gym and doing what they can to help themselves stay fit and healthy while hopefully addressing the injury itself. That's why today I brought Dan Pope on the podcast to talk about how we can continue to train while injured, but even more importantly, how we can learn from our injuries as well. Dan is a doctor of physical therapy strength and conditioning coach, writer, speaker, and entrepreneur. He's a practicing physical therapist at Champion PT and Performance and owner of the fitnesspainfree.com website and certification. Dan's mission is to bridge the gap between physical therapy and fitness and to bring this information to those around the world. Now, if you're a regular to the show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, cueing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically, anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. Now, like I told you up top, I've had more than my fair share of injuries along the way. And being in the coaching game for 22 plus years now, not a day goes by where I don't have a client or athlete that I'm coaching that isn't dealing with some sort of ache, pain, or boo-boo when they're working out. So in our show today, Dan and I start by talking about his overarching philosophy with regard to injuries and why clients and athletes need to shift their mindset when they're injured. We talk about the two types of rehab clients that you'll have and why you have to communicate with them very differently to get a great outcome. From there, we dive into two of the main joints your clients and athletes will have issues with, the lower back and the knee. We'll talk about why so many people have issues there, some of the primary drivers of pain and dysfunction, and what we can do as trainers, coaches, and rehab professionals to keep them training and feeling great. This is just an incredibly practical show, and I really think you're going to love the back and forth discussion between Dan and myself. But enough for me, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll jump into this awesome episode with Dan Pope. Did you know that in any given year, 40% of the trainers and coaches in our industry will leave our industry? Maybe that's why it seems like almost every day I talk to trainers and coaches who are frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if this sounds anything like you, let me tell you how I can help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you. People who are serious about the results they get and know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is going to take the last 20 plus years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In the cert, you'll learn how to use my R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. You'll learn the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym to help your clients squat, hinge, press, and pull with awesome technique. You'll learn my streamlined assessment process that will help you determine the exact movements your clients should be performing when they come in the gym. And last but not least, you'll learn how to create relationships and build rapport with virtually everyone you train so you can get the best possible results. Of course, there's a lot more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the CERT is all about. Now here's the thing, 
Spots for the CERT only open twice per year for a limited time. But if you join my free insiders list now, you'll be able to save $200 when my next group opens. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, that's completecoachcertification.com and then stay tuned for our launch emails very soon. Thank you so much for your support and I hope you'll join us when the next Complete Coach Certification launches. Dan, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Mike. I am I'm very excited too. So pumped to pump the to chat today. Yes. So my name's Dan. I'm a physical therapist. Um, I was a strength conditioning coach for a few years before before becoming a physical therapist. Uh, just a quick backstory. So I've always loved strength and fitness. I was uh, the meathead that was bringing like old rusty chains from my dad's farm yes. into the commercial gym so I could try like West Side Barbell dynamic system stuff. Yeah. And I'd have like one chain that's like 15 pounds and one's 35 and I'm <laughs> getting like rust on the floor and like I don't care just because I love this stuff so much, you right. know? Uh, so that was always my background and went to school for exercise science and it was an easy transition to start doing personal training just because I love fitness so much. Uh, but the big thing I was finding is that I'd have a lot of injuries I was working with and it was frustrating to me and I would refer to some physical therapists and, you know, the physical therapist would tell me like, of course, they're getting hurt. You're doing bat, you're doing deadlifts, you're doing kettlebell swings, you're doing overhead press. That's why they're getting hurt. You need to stop doing that. Right. And I, I just kind of knew that, that that was probably false, you know, in a lot of ways. Right. It's not like you can just overhead press every day of your life and your shoulders will be fine. Right. Um, but it just didn't seem right to me. So I went to physical therapy school because I wanted to be able to help folks in the strength and fitness world. Um, and I've been doing that for years. I love it. And now I've kind of transitioned a bit towards helping other people do what I do. And I do a combination of treating patients on a regular basis combined with an educational um, business, fitnesspainfree.com. So. I, I love it, man. That's awesome. So talk to me when you were first getting in the gym, you know, those rusty chains <clears throat> doing the West Side Barbell dynamic effort method. Uh, talk to me about like what started that? What got you into fitness in the first place? I don't know. It's always a, that's a funny story. You know, I, I will say my grandfather was always um, into fitness. So he I lived into his nineties and he was like running into his like late eighties and playing baseball into his eighties. And oh his uh, twin sister died of a heart attack around the age of 50. Right. And uh, for that generation, exercise is not a normal thing, right? It's kind of, right. yeah, exercise. It's funny because it's, it's a bit of a newer thing in terms of popularity and cultural shifts, but um, generational shifts, I guess. But uh, he always pushed the importance of exercise on me from an early age. And I just got started with basic kind of weight training. Uh, running was a big thing. And I, I played a lot of sports. And you find kind of early on that if you want to be better at sports, if, if you just kind of strength train on the side, it, it's helpful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just found that I loved it. It was helpful for me from a, kind of a self-esteem perspective, building my sense of self, being stronger, wanting to be stronger. That was one of the ways I was able to do it. So I just glommed to it. And then I just kind of became obsessed with it. You know, I remember reading about like training programs at like 11, 30, 12 at nighttime and like trying to go to sleep and then laying in my bed, just like thinking about like this, like recipe I'm going to try to make the next day to make these <laughs> anabolic meatballs or something stupid that I read about, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's just been a really, a really big passion of mine. Um, and I, I love it, you know, and I've had a few influences over the course of time, but it, it's just been natural to me, I guess. I love it. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, talk to us about your career path because you said you were a trainer first and then you went back to PT school. I mean, that's a little yeah, bit different so, than most, right? Most people, it's just like school, school, school. So talk to me about your career path and some of the stops you've had along the way. Yeah, for sure. So um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do growing up. <clears throat> so um, I had great parents that pushed me to do something that I loved and that was great. So I just always loved nutrition. I always loved exercise. Those are kind of my biggest passions. So I went to Rutgers University. I think that the typical, we can talk about this a little bit later because I think it's a little bit, you know, backwards and the system as it is, is a little bit uh, interesting, but I just went to school because that was kind of the natural next step. And I know that I loved exercise. I love nutrition. So I try to do a double major in exercise uh, science as well as nutrition. When I graduated, the next natural step was to do some sort of personal training, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I actually used to think that physical therapy was stupid. And that was kind of 
because I had a few experiences and I don't even want to throw those physical therapists under the bus because I don't think they're bad. It's just that I was a young athlete, right? As you know, competing at Rutgers University as a pole vaulter, hurt my shoulder, right? Go to the physical therapist and ultrasound my shoulder and tell me it might get better. It might not give me like the easiest exercises I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm like a young, stubborn guy. And I'm like, these are dumb. Why am I doing them? <laughs> and that was my view on physical therapy. I was like, well, physical therapy is stupid. I don't, I don't want to go back and, and do that or go into that profession. Um, and I think if, if you go to the standard outpatient setting, you'll, you'll kind of see a lot of that. And it's, it's not a bad thing. I'm, I'm talking crap on it, obviously, but you know, people need that type of physical therapy and that's good, but it just didn't attract me at all. But what was kind of cool is that as a personal trainer, I started to be influenced by some earlier names out there in the physical therapy world. One of which is Mike Reinold, who's my boss now, which is really cool. But I just kind of found that there are a lot of cool physical therapists out there. They're doing things that seemed a lot more fun that the typical physical therapist was doing, you know? Um, So as I was a trainer, I was learning from these folks and I was starting to think like, okay, well, it seems like there is uh, this niche that needs to be filled, which is basically physical therapy for um, fit people, right? Yeah, yeah. So I really wanted to learn more about that, and that definitely intrigued me. And I kind of asked my que- this question um, at that age when I was thinking about what the next steps were, right? It was kind of like, all right. And then folks like yourself were kind of doing it at the time. So you, Tony Gentlecore is one of the names uh, out there, and you know, one of the career paths is kind of like be a strength and conditioning coach, maybe become a massage therapist. So you can do some manual therapy, you know, uh, or become a physical therapist, which, you know, you need a license and it's a lot of money to go to school and it's a lot more time commitment. Uh, but at least in my mind, it's like, well, if I want to be the best person out there, and that was my initial goal, be as yeah. good as I possibly could be working with injured individuals and getting them back to high levels of competition, you know, in fitness, whatever it is. Um, I probably wanted to get this degree and go down that pathway. Because, um, you know, it's, it's a no brainer to me. Like if you're, if you have a problem in your house, right. <clears throat> Let's say like the lights go out, you probably want to call the electrician, right? Yeah. Uh, you may call a plumber. They might have a little bit of experience in that route, but you probably want to get the electrician. And at least in my mind, like strength coaches are phenomenal with pain and injury when, when they're good at it. Right. But yep. it, it's not the profession that's designed to do that. Physical therapists, all they do every single day is work with injuries every, every single day. Right. Mm-hmm. So at least in my mind, I wanted to be part of that community of individuals that was in the trenches. And I thought that was the best way for me to become, you know, the professional I wanted to be. So that led me to going to physical therapy school, right? And um, during that entire time, I I really tried my best to stay connected with the fitness community. But um, I definitely went down an enormous rabbit hole of physical therapy. And, you know, I've come out at this end with a cool blend of the two, which I really enjoy. Uh, and that's where we're at now. I love it. Well, and here's one of the things, and I've talked about this with a handful of people over the years, guests on the show, most recently a kid named Mike Reinhardt. Kid, I, he's probably 30 now, I don't know. But uh, but he was an intern with us, like a, a strength and conditioning intern, then went to PT school and came back. And I think it's such a wonderful blend when people such as yourself, you come out or you start with this coaching background, right? So you get used to interacting with people and programming strength and conditioning And then you get all of this extra background and knowledge on injuries. So like you said, at the end, it's like this beautiful like mesh of the two versus if you're just a strength coach or just a PT, you know, sometimes your your experience and your worldview is a little bit limited. So if you get both those, it really allows you to do some powerful things. Yeah, I agree with you big time. Uh, I was actually a little bit turned off by uh, physical therapy within my uh, university initially because all of my kind of heroes at the time, you know, I was learning a lot from, let's say, Shirley Sarman or Gray Cook. They're really big names. They still are big names, but I think back then they were enormous names. Yes. I would kind of, Stu McGill, I would mention those names to some of my professors and they're like, who's this person? You know, I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, and I was like, whoa, well, red flag. Like, that doesn't seem good. Right. And to be completely honest, if, if you, you know, weren't kind of familiar with the strength conditioning world and you went through physical therapy school, it's pretty common for folks not to hear of those names. Yep. And I would say they're not really the titans that they seem to be in the strength conditioning world. I'm not trying to knock on them because they're, they're obviously, you know, very helpful folks and very, um, I don't know, they've given me a backbone to the way I treat every single day. Uh, But the other part is that they're really not as well known in in the physical therapy world. So uh, you do get a big disconnect 
And like you said, connecting these two worlds is very, very useful, right? You know, I, I think that there's a lot to be learned from these folks that uh, other professionals in the strength conditioning world, like yourself, have taken their information and kind of spread that into the strength conditioning world. Um, so that's phenomenal, right? There's, yeah. there's a lot of power there. I love it. Okay, so let's dive in. I'd love to hear your overarching philosophy for dealing with and training <clears throat> around pain or injuries, because this is always... A touchy topic, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, my big thing is uh, keep them in the gym, right? Keep them training, keep them doing whatever they're doing. I think that's incredibly important. Um, I, sometimes physical therapists don't think this way, and I think it's because we're kind of programmed by insurance companies um, that we can only do this or we should only do this, right? But any, at the end of the day, health and fitness is one of the most important things that people have, right? You can argue that's maybe the most important thing that people have, right? Maybe next to family or something else. Um, when you lose that, <clears throat> a lot of bad things occur and you also end up being very expensive to our healthcare system, right? Yes. So one of the things that happens, and there's quite a bit of research on this with all different pathologies is that if you stop exercising, you become more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. You become less healthy. Yes. So injuries are a huge threat to this, right? And it's also huge from a sporting, you know, situation too. If you have, if you're a high level athlete and you get hurt, right? That's bad. You're not progressing, right? You're, you know, may end up keeping you from your sport. You have to retire from that. It's, it's a major, major problem. Sure. Um, so for me, I, I want to try to keep people exercising as much as we possibly can, right? Mm -hmm. And two things, and you know this, like if you have a shoulder injury, of course you can still train your lower body, right? Some athletes get hurt and they get an injury and they kind of spiral into this extremely bad psychological place where they stop doing everything, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they go the opposite way and they keep on blowing through their pain and then things get worse over the course of time. And there's all different flavors of people, right? But at the end of the day, there's a lot we still can do. And the other cool thing from a rehab perspective is that, and I tell this people all the time, is that exercise is medicine. It's the medicine that's going to help you get better, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a few caveats, right? As a physical therapist, I'm always looking for medical red flags. Is there's a reason why I need to either refer this person out to a different professional, right? Or they need to stop exercising. Because if I have someone who has, let's say, a shin splint, right? And it's actually a stress fracture. I need to make sure that I send them to a doctor and they shouldn't be running and jumping on that thing, right? Yep. But if it's like a tendon issue, then I know that doing some sort of exercise is going to be beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. And as a physical therapist, strength coach, right, I think it gets a little murky depending on how like, comfortable you are working with these injuries. If you give them the right exercise, and as a strength coach or personal trainer, that right exercise is allowing them to continue training, right, and working towards their fitness goals without irritating the injured area, right, that's going to keep working that person towards their goals. Obviously, a strength coach can do that, and so can a physical therapist. But if you dose that appropriately, you're also, without realizing it sometimes, rehabilitating that person. Yep. Because if you're applying the right stress to that person in the right dosages, they're going to improve over the course of time. And as they progress and get better, we start incorporating higher level exercises. And now we're, we're working towards their strength goals, fitness goals, sport goals, we're also rehabbing at the same time. So my whole brand of physical therapy is how to do that, right? Yep. How do we keep people exercising? How do we keep people active? How do we continue you know, working towards one of the most valuable things that we have, our health and our wellness, right? Or our sport, if you're an athlete. Um, and allowing that area to heal, respecting the healing injury site and getting people better in the process. For sure. One of my favorite quotes, and I'll, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't know it verbatim, but this was probably 15, 20 years ago. Eric Cressy was talking about, hey, look, man, you come in and you have a torn ACL. Okay, you still have one healthy leg, a fully functioning core, two arms. Like, hey, man, yes, you have to rehab that area, but the rest of your body is healthy take advantage of this time and like shifting that mindset, I think is so important. Yeah, it's crazy too. And I think we're learning more and more about how powerful that is. Uh, just your example about the ACL, we've got some research that shows if you train your contralateral side, right, you have like a 40% carryover, enormous carryover, more than if you were, you know, not hurt, right? That carryover yeah. effect is strong. And, you know, if you're just training that, you know, without realizing what you're doing, you're actually rehabbing your leg, right? You're rehabbing the ACL area. So just good stuff when you do that for sure so talk to me a little bit more about that if you're dealing with somebody and they are dealing with pain or they're dealing with an injury what are some things that you do to help them shift that mindset and like let them know hey it's okay to stay in the gym and keep getting after it maybe in a little bit different ways 
Yeah, for sure. And it really totally depends on the individual. And I think this is really important for people to hear, especially kind of new grads uh, that haven't seen a lot of patients, don't have that experience, right? Uh, right now, there's a very positive mindset that's going on in the, I would say, social media, physical therapy world. It's a mindset of hope for mm-hmm. people, right? Yep. <clears throat> because I think the majority of people need to be pushed. They need to exercise more. Uh, they're kind of held back by their injury. So essentially, if they have some sort of pain problem, they feel like they need to lay in bed and not move at all. We know that's not the case. Right. And we need to get people moving regardless of whether or not they're hurt. So we need to give them that positive message of exercise is good. We need to push that, Right. A lot of folks feel that when they experience any sort of pain, they're making the area worse, right? And the only way to get better is to rest. In reality, there are a lot of pathologies that we know that we rest them, they don't get better. They just masquerade in the background. And then when you start to push again, it just pops up. So people are like, I have a bum knee. I have a bum shoulder. I can't do things anymore. It sucks to be, you know, 30 years old, 40 (laughs) years old, 50 years old, insert age here, just because they don't have the right mindset and they don't understand it, right? So for those folks, what I often tell them is that exercise is medicine. And I talk about a few research studies. There's a couple cool research studies where they are comparing pain problems. So let's say rotator cuff related pain. So shoulder pain, kind of, you know, garden variety, shoulder pain, Achilles pain, low back pain. So just very common pain pathologies that people deal with. And they lump them into two groups. One group is allowed to work through a little bit of pain. And the second group is not, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. if it hurts, bad, don't do it. What happens is that they both have the same long-term outcome, right? But in the short term, the people that are allowed to push a little pain actually get better a little bit faster, mm-hmm. right? We've got a bunch of research like this. And again, you have to rule out red flags because if you're trying to you know, exercise through a stress fracture, like that's not good, right? Um, but for most issues, exercising through a little bit of pain is not going to delay the rehab process. If anything, it might actually accelerate it. So I try to shift people's mindset to if you feel the pain while you're exercising, that's good. It means we're putting the medicine in the right area. And if you're not feeling pain, we might not be pushing hard enough, right? Right. That really helps some folks. On the flip end, and I say this because, again, it depends completely on the person, population, super important for like new grads to hear. If you have a CrossFitter, that's used to pushing through pain all the time or an athlete that pushes through pain all the time, right? The reason why they're still hurting is probably because they're overdoing it. Yeah. So sometimes I am okay with putting some fear into that person's head, right? I'm okay with them telling them like, look, if you don't stop, this is going to keep on masquerading. You know, it's not going to get better. It might actually get worse, right? Yeah. And I think this a lot of times comes down to athletes identity and self sense of self, right? So when, injury, when an athlete gets injured, it's like an identity crisis. I'm, I'm stealing that directly from Chris Johnson. I believe it's so true. So essentially that if you have a pain problem and basically your sense of self is completely wrapped up in being this high low athlete or a strong person or fit person, all of a sudden you get hurt, right? You feel like you have no value to the world anymore, right? You yeah. think like your parents, you know, the people around you no longer see you as a good, strong, capable human being. And that's uh, tremendously challenging for, you know, an athlete. So what they may do is just deny that. They're like, nah, you know, I'm just going to ignore this pain. I'm going to keep pushing through this pain and I'm going to keep on doing these reps and, you know, I'm not going to stop. Right. Yeah. And that's tricky to deal with because you essentially you've got an athlete here that, (laughs) you know, they're going to keep on doing what they want to do just because of this enormous problem they have. But I think it's an educational process. I talk about things like, Um, like RPE. So essentially people continue making uh, progress in the gym without actually having to push as hard as they can. We can use strategies like blood flow restriction training. So we're kind of building strength and building hypertrophy at the same exact rate as you would normally, right? While respecting this area, I try to educate them on this process of like, look, you've been going through this for years. And what happens is you get a little bit better, you get hurt and you get worse. Then you push it again, you get hurt, you get worse. So really you're not making progress. So we can dial back It's going to make you a better athlete. It's going to increase your sense of self. So you're just trying to play these little tricks and get people to realize that kind of pulling back for a bit is going to lead to something that's better in the long term, Mm -hmm. right? And this is a tricky process because we're kind of trying to get individuals to realize that these pain problems aren't that big a deal without directly telling them that their pain problem is not that big a deal, right? (laughs) because we have to really respect and have empathy that they're going through this really challenging process while just getting them to realize like, dude, it's okay. You're going to get better. Like you just change these few things, right? It'll be all right. It's not the end of the world. And then as you start to turn that corner and get better, you'll, you'll realize that and you'll feel a lot better. 
Um, but if you tell someone that right off the bat, right, you, you may lose them. They may hate you, right, right. And, and never return. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tricky. All right, my friend, we're going to take a quick break in this episode to remind you about the upcoming Complete Coach Seminar. It's going to be March 24th through 26th, Seattle, Washington, at my guy, Luca Hasavar's gym. If you've considered doing the cert before but haven't taken the plunge, or maybe if you just learn better in a live environment, this is going to be an amazing opportunity. We're going to cover all of the stuff that we would in the cert, assessments, program design, coaching and queuing, progressing and regressing activities, but you're going to have the benefit of doing it live, working with other coaches, being able to ask myself questions. It's just going to be an amazing learning environment and an amazing opportunity. Most importantly, we're going to learn a lot and we're going to have fun. So if you want to learn more about the seminar, go to completecoachcertification.com forward slash seminar. Again, completecoachcertification.com forward slash seminar. I hope to see you there. Now let's jump back into our episode with Dan Pope. It's so funny you say that because I guess I had never thought of classifying people in that sense, but I immediately thought of individuals that I've worked with that fall into those buckets, right? The first person is like, if they have even a hint of pain or a twinge or anything, they're afraid they're going to re-injure themselves, right? So with those people, I would always talk about, hey, you can have pain up to like a two, right? Because nobody's scared of a two out of 10, right? And you just give them that little bit of wiggle room to work through it. But then I've also had the other people too. And luckily, most of the athletes I've, I've worked with have been very smart. But I always have one or two that's like, no, I'm just going to grind through this. I'm going to get through this. And I find with those people, like giving them that understanding of like, look, there's a plan in place here, right? Here's the timeline. Here's what we have to do so that this doesn't continue, right? And so it's just funny the way you labeled that and described those people because I can totally see those two ends of the spectrum. And you're right. You have to manage them totally differently. Yeah, you're so right. And that's, uh, you know, I work with a lot of students and it's one of the hardest things for students to kind of grasp, you know, yep. because when you start off, you're, you're so swept up in like, all right, I want to make sure I'm actually diagnosing this person, right? Let's make sure they don't have cancer. Let's get the right diagnosis. Let's get the right treatments out there. But the entire time I'm doing evaluation, I'm trying to figure out the mindset of that person. Like, you know, when they answer questions about pain, like some folks will say like, Hey, I have a high pain threshold or I have, you know, discomfort. They won't even like say they have pain. Some folks have that interesting, like mindset of like things don't hurt unless it's like extremely bad. Right. Right. And I, I tell folks that because people have to, I mean, when your body is hurting and you have pain, your body's trying to tell you something, right? Mm -hmm. So for some folks, I actually want them to be a little bit more mindful. Those people that kind of ignore the pain all the time, like I have an ultra high pain threshold, I just push through it. So like pain for me is different than you know someone else, which I don't know what that means. You know what <laughs> I mean? I just kind of a weird thing that people say, you hear it a lot, but I want them to have a little bit of mindfulness about their pain. Yep. Because if you're just kind of blowing through and ignoring it all the time, that's not helpful. Yeah. And I tell folks that pain will win, right? Yeah. So if if basically, if you're going for a run and your your hamstring is killing you and you're like, I'm going to run through this, your body and your brain's going to be like, this guy is a lunatic. He's trying to hurt me. I'm going to elevate this pain. Yes. Eventually, your brain kind of wins. It's like, nah, dude, you can't keep doing this. I'm going to make you hurt even worse. Mm -hmm. So I think we're trying to build trust with our body. So I tell these folks, that, hey, just be mindful of it. Like you said, give them some guidelines about pain, 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10, whatever it is. Have them respect that. So over the course of time, your body starts to say, okay, we can handle this. This person's not a lunatic. I don't have to create pain all the time. We're getting stronger, we're moving in the right direction, right? Yep. Um, and then you have people on the flip side that maybe are not getting better because like they're too afraid to push. So, you know, during this evaluation process, and it's extremely hard and it gets better as you see people more and more, you build a relationship with people, you, you kind of see what their behavior's on and you coach them. It's like anything else. You're kind of coaching them when it's like, oh, okay, it's okay to push through this or, or maybe we need to hold back a little bit. And I, I always tell the patients in front of me, it's like, this is an experimental process. I'm not sure how this is going to go, but I'm, I'm guessing as best I can. And if things don't go well, we can always change it, right? No big deal there. For sure. So one of the most debilitating injuries that we see you I all of us that have been trainers or coaches that we deal with and around in the gym is lower back pain so I would love to hear from you as a physical therapist as a strength coach 
What do you feel are some of the biggest drivers of lower back pain? Yeah, for sure. I think this is kind of a loaded question. Um, I don't know. I make for a career sure. out of answering <laughs> this, so it's not a bad thing, right? I think most injuries are multifactorial, right? I don't know. If you're walking down the street and someone drops like a washer out of their window and it hits you in the head, it's probably the washer that caused it, not that you didn't sleep well the night before, right? right. But there's a lot of things that kind of probably lead to people having like an onset of low back pain. If you start looking into this literature, it's it's very fascinating because you'll find all these weird things that correlate with the onset of pain, right? Yeah. So having a job with a lot of conflict is actually a big one, right? Yep. Um, you know, dissatisfaction with your work environment in general, not feeling like you have, like you're not very high on the totem pole is another one. So if you're kind of low on the totem pole, maybe this comes back to stress. I think at the end of the day, we don't exactly know why people have pain problems yep. because if you do a whole bunch of MRIs of someone's spine, you'll find pathology, right? And some people hurt, some people don't. So what are those variables influence people getting pain? And a lot of that is probably stressors in their life, right? Whether or not you're recovering well, so eating enough, you'll see this a lot in like the bone stress injury literature, right? If you're like fed well, which I think is a no brainer for someone like you or me, right. it's like, there's no way that nutrition doesn't have an influence on pain and injury. Right. We tend not to think about it as physical therapists. Sleep is a big one. So sleep is huge. Essentially, if you don't sleep well, if you haven't been sleeping well, you're much more likely to get hurt. If you don't sleep well after you have an injury, you're much more likely to have chronic pain, right? Yep. So if you don't sleep well after you have an injury, you heal slower or may not heal at all. You know, that's a big one. <clears throat> and then you have all the, the common ones that you tend to think about from like a biomechanical standpoint. So if you look at, let's say, the literature on strength athletes, let's say powerlifters or strongman athletes, the number one injury is usually the low back. But that's probably because your main lifts are going to be, you know, even the bench press, you're using your back a lot because you're yeah. arching like crazy. Yep. And then you're deadlifting heavy and then you're squatting heavy. So your spine just takes a lot of stress. Yep. And you get to a point where your your back's like, I can't handle this. And it breaks, you know, it, you know that's a bad way of saying it. But that's right. in, in a sense, that's kind of what happens, right? Then you have things like the acute to chronic workload ratio. So essentially, you can build up your fitness slowly over the course of time. So I always make the analogy of tennis elbow and a gardener versus tennis elbow and elite tennis player. So in an elite tennis player, they have to put a ton of stress through that tendon for it to start hurting. But if you have someone who never does and they just guard him for the day, they can end with, with tennis elbow, you yeah. know, which is kind of hilarious to think about. But if you build your capacity very slowly over the course of time, you're, you're a little less likely to get hurt. Uh, this one is huge in the CrossFit world because CrossFit, you know, they hang their hat on exercise variation being their, one of the key principles of their entire programming, yep. which I think is fun. But it also gets people in hot water because if you start tracking the amount of repetitions of, let's say, a squat in a given week, and I see this all the time, you might have a few weeks of, let's say, total amount of repetitions around 100 throughout the course of the entire week, 100 reps of loaded squats. And then you have a week that's like 400 or 500. And what happens is that people are still coming the same amount of days per week and the workouts are the same length, but they, there was a huge variation in what was actually you know given in that 60-minute slot. Yep. People might not see that. Like I, I still go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour session, but they had a huge spike mm -hmm. in their training volume or in training intensity, I think is another one of the low back, right? Yep. Um, I could talk all day about this, but I'll just mention one more. So I think that um, kind of prior injury is a big one for folks. Um, and I think the thing that's tough to wrap your head around, and I was just talking to an athlete about this the other day, is that you know some folks and some joints, they just don't tolerate stress as well as someone else. So let's say that you're training for years and you start developing some hip pain and your hip pain is related to squatting. So moving forward, your hip may enjoy one or two weeks of training per week and do really well. But if you start pumping that up to two, three, four times a week, your hip might not enjoy that. And if you're in the sport of Olympic weightlifting, that's a really tough pill to swallow because everyone else around you might be squatting four or five times a week, but that might not be what your hip likes. Yep. Right. So if you have a history of prior injury, or you have a current injury, you're much more likely to turn that into a worse injury. And we have some cool research that's starting to show that. Um, so there's it's some of the factors right yeah. there. I know yeah. that's a long answer, but I, I also feel like it's a more accurate answer than just saying like your technique was off or, you know, you weren't sleeping well or whatever it is, you know, and all those things can play a role. Agreed. First off, I love the fact that you talked about it being multifactorial because I just think too often we're just like, you know, whatever, like you said, oh, it's just weak hamstrings 
or, you know, oh, they're, you know, bad technique. Like trying to laser in on this one thing versus saying, oh, well, maybe his technique isn't great. His workload spiked. Uh, he's in a lot of stress at work, like looking at all of those things in conjunction. And that's something I always try and relay to, to my clients and athletes, right? They're like, oh, well, what's, what's going on with our training program? You know, why did I have this little tweak? And I'm like, well, we trained for 12 months consecutively with no issues. Okay. So like what else is maybe going on that drove this? Not to say that I don't play a part in that, but there's a lot that goes on when somebody gets injured and you can't just say, oh, it was this exercise or this activity Lots of things play into it. Yeah, I think that's tough too, because one of the reasons why people pay us is because they don't want to get hurt, right? So we're trying to do this in a smart way. The other piece is if you look at any recreational activity, there are injuries and they just happen, you know? So I think part of it is like pain injury is just a part of it. And, uh, you know, the clients that get that, it's a lot easier because every once in a while, like, hey, I get hurt often. I'll say that a couple times a year, I get some sort of injury. And I very much expect it and that's okay. And we can get through that and move on, you know, Uh, but some folks have a hard time with that, you know? Yes. So it is what it is, but I think getting hurt just comes with the territory. So especially like as a personal trainer, I remember when I was a coach, if I ever had someone get hurt on my like watch, it just like freaked me out. I was like, man, what did I do wrong? Is something really terrible going on with my training program? This is a bad decision. And it's good to reflect on that because you get to kind of be a detective and figure out yeah. why and try not to repeat past mistakes. But part of it is like if people are going to get hurt and that's that's just the nature of the beast. So Agreed. Okay, so with that being said, I try and remember my days when I first started as a trainer, as a coach. I was powerlifting at the time. So everything revolved around barbell back squats, bench presses, and deadlifts. So I try and be conscious of the fact that's the lens that I saw things through. For the young coach or the young physical therapist that's listening to this show, what are some easy tweaks or modifications we can make so that we can continue training without re-injuring the lower back? Yeah, for sure. So going back to the original plan, right? Rule out red flag. Just make sure a person's basically not pooping their pants, you know, and they're getting progressive weakness. Don't have any like crazy red flags going on. Numbness and tingling in the groin region, right? Uh, barring the red flag stuff, we want to continue exercise as much as possible. And this stuff doesn't always work. I, you know, people always, you know, respond to my Instagram, like this exercise actually kills when I try to do it with shoulder pain. (laughs) Like it's, it's not always perfect. Right. But I think there are some principles that work really well. So in general, when people have any injury, but especially low back issues, oftentimes load is what they don't handle well. Yeah. Right. So think about a heavy deadlift versus light deadlift. Your back is killing you. You're not going to pick up something that's really heavy, right? Yep. And I think the other thing that um, you can modify pretty easily is going to be some of the the biomechanics, right? Yep. So, you know, this is it's funny because I, I kind of hated physics in, in high school and college. And then when these topics became kind of important from a physical therapy perspective, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> yeah. I wish I paid attention a little bit more. But if you think about the difference of like a barbell, low bar barbell back squat, where you're really sitting your hips back far and aggressively, right? Which you'll see some more in the powerlifting world. And then you think about an Olympic weightlifter is much more upright when they squat. Think about a front squat. So they have to be able to catch a barbell in a deep squat, like a snatch. So if they send the hips back aggressively, the bar is probably going to fall forward, right? It's not an optimal position. But when you send the hips back really far, what happens is you create a larger moment arm for the hip and the spine. So the hip and the spine just has to work harder, right? Yeah. And if you get very upright and you're bringing your hips forward and knees forward, you just create a larger moment arm for the knee, right? Yeah. So I think the first thing to understand is that you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So if you just tell someone the best way to squat is upright because less stress in the spine, it's like, well, you're just putting more stress on the knee. So <laughs> hopefully those knees are going to be able to handle this. Right. But if someone has a bunch of low back pain and the goal is to continue exercising and giving them some sort of stress so the area heals over the course of time, we can just adopt the more upright posture during our lower body exercises, right? So for deadlifting, if you go from, let's say, a, a straight barbell conventional deadlift to, let's say, a sumo deadlift, you're a little more upright, or even a trap bar deadlift, right, or a high handle trap bar deadlift, you're getting that torso much more upright. The knees are coming forward. You're providing a moment arm for the knees to do a little bit more work. You're taking a little stress off the spine, right? Yep. Uh, the other piece of advice that's really easy and a bit of a no-brainer is that when you're doing a lower body exercise, it's bilateral, like a squat or a deadlift. You have two legs and you have one spine, right? And usually the the limiting factor in completing that lift is going to be usually spine strength, 
right? Yeah. So if you go from a double leg exercise to a single legged exercise, right? Now the leg becomes a limiting factor and there's a lot less stress on the spine. So basically single legged exercises are probably useful for a variety of reasons. One of which is being, you're now taking more stress and applying it to the legs and the legs are limiting factor and the spine is not right. Yeah. So something like a step up uh, or lunge variation is usually pretty well tolerated in folks that have low back pain for that reason. But the other piece is if when you're doing a step up or a lunge, your, your torso is pretty dang upright, yeah. right? So you're not putting as much stress through the spine. So generally speaking, we can alter the either exercise variation, right, <clears throat> that you're using or just a cueing that you're using. We can modify the load. So let's say you're supposed to be doing three rep maxes or five rep maxes at 80 to 90 percent of your one rep max. If you just increase the reps, let's say you're doing sets of, let's say, eight to 12 and you're keeping the load a little bit more moderate or maybe keeping the RPE a little bit more moderate, you can still make some progress yep. and not irritate the spine, right? Yep. And then you could always, if none of that's working, you can switch to other modifications. I love barbell um, hip thrusts just because they tend to feel pretty good on the back, but they train the pretty similar musculature sure. as a uh, deadlift. Or if you need to, single-legged exercises. Uh, and kind of my last ditch effort is switching to something like blood flow restriction training. If they can't handle any of those things. Um, simply put, if you've had some bad low back pain, getting out of the bed is like, you know, the worst thing in the world, like let alone actually Absolutely. getting to the gym. Um, but once folks are out of that stage of pain and they can actually roll out of bed and get to the gym, then you can mess around with some light body weight exercises. If you have access to BFR, that's great. You can start loading some single legged exercises and as they to tolerate it, maybe some bilateral loading like a hip thrust and then progressing towards some easier, slower variations of squats and deadlifts. And you progress along from there. I love it. I love it. Okay. So one thing I wanted to, to comment on here, because I think it's such a great point. When people start talking about fill in the blank joint sparing strategies, right? Like knee sparing strategies, which we're going to talk about the knee here in a minute. So it's like, okay, just sit back really far, right? And like you just alluded to, what most people don't think about is, okay, if I take stress off one joint, I'm probably going to overload another. And I just don't think enough people respect that. It's like magically you have reduced total system load and spared a joint. And there's no other like negative co potential consequences, right? Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. <laughs> I, I'm just it it just blows my mind because you know people are, oh spare the shoulder, spare the knee, spare the spine. It's like that's great. Just know that you're just putting that stress somewhere else, right? You're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like you yeah. said, like I believe in. Hey man, sometimes you need to do that. You need to modify, but just know and understand like everything has. A cost or a consequence yeah it, for sure anyway. I, I do think that i sorry i just said uh, no, just thought i had based on your last comment in some instances i do think that's helpful you know like mm -hmm. you had said so something like powerlifting, if if everyone's back is killing them and we can like make the movement maybe a little bit more knee dominant at some yeah. times yeah right then maybe we're going to reduce the low back burden and then yeah. knee can handle some of that because it's not taking as much but to your point, I, I do find it hilarious and people are like, this is the best exercise technique <laughs> for everyone because we're sparing this. Yeah. Like, come on. You know, that's that's so like simple in terms of thinking. But yeah. It's funny you say that too, because if you look at like, I mean, I grew up obviously around powerlifting in the powerlifting world and I just consumed everything powerlifting related. But if you look at some of like the OG guys, right, like an Ed Cone. Ed Cohn's off-season squat program revolved around high bar squats, right? So shifting that emphasis. Uh, Brad Gillingham, who's a guy I've never had on the show, but tons of respect for, he was a big believer in front squats for large swaths of the off-season. And again, whether they knew it or not, as far as sparing a joint or whatever, it's like, hey, let's just shift the emphasis a little bit, try and kind of rebuild ourselves. And ultimately, I think it keeps you healthier and probably in the game a little bit longer i agree you know i you know rest in peace louis simmons you know i learned so much from him right but i also feel like i just got way too biased towards his world you mm -hmm. know sure and then he has it's such a specific world right so yeah. basically power lifters that are wearing squat suits you know he and like 
you know, bench shirts, like the, the whole way that I trained my bench, I think was backwards because I was not wearing a shirt. Oh yeah. And basically they're training the positions that are weak when you have a shirt on. Right. So yes. all that board press, you know, all the floor press, like probably yeah. didn't help me when I fail off my chest every <laughs> single time I max out. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe you, I was kind of, I had my blinders on. I think I was just biased. Young didn't really understand that. But if you look at some of the other greats, right, they were following some of these opposite or opposing kind of viewpoints with a lot of success, right? Yeah. Well, and that could probably be a whole podcast, just geared versus non-geared lifting. And I mean, look, one thing Louis did get, and this is like inarguable basically, but he understood the said principle, right? Like he understood where to train based on the way they were going to compete, the way they were judged. Like, I mean, that's why you saw those guys where part of its environment, part of its said principle, but man, just you see guys that are totaling 2,000 in, in a year or two, they're 2,300, 2,400. It's like their numbers just exploded. So they're super strong. Yeah, yeah, pretty amazing to watch. And I don't mean to talk any, you know, throw any shade on Louie, like Not a lot of all. stuff. Um, yeah, it, one of the things, a little piece of information that, you know, you were alluding to, I tell my students all the time, and, you know, you do a great job of this. And I actually point a lot of folks to you, but in the, physical therapy world programming is not really taught. Yeah. Um, so it's one of those things that is lacking when people come out. Um, it's not as important for the average person and the general population. So we can see why it's, it's not taught. It's not tested. I, yeah, that's fine, but uh, it's, it's a sorely lacking skill, right? Yeah. One of the things I talk about is like, if you look at Louis Simmons and you know, how often they squatted or deadlifting, like you can argue they almost never, you know, deadlifted heavy. Right. You know, they did some dynamic effort and they did a lot of good mornings and they really didn't even squat that much either. Right. Except for, you know, dynamic effort work. So like the volume they had of like the major lifts were so low. Right. right. And then if you look at some of these Olympic weightlifting program programs or different programs from around the world, they might be squatting or benching four, five, six, seven times per week. Right. And it's yeah. very different yet they still have world champions, right? They still have incredibly strong folks. So yep. one of the things I tell some of the students is like, look, these, you know, we got to find a couple of good systems that work well for you, but just keep in mind, there's a lot of good ways to do it yes. because you know, students get confused because oh, they yeah. are tremendous, right? And, and both ends of the spectrum are saying that they're right, right? Yeah. They probably are because they both do work, but there's different ways to do it, you know? Yep. So. Absolutely. I love that, man. Okay. So I want to touch on one more topic here before we start to wrap up. And another common issue that I'm sure most trainers and coaches have dealt with at some point in time is patellofemoral pain at the knee. And you probably hate that term. I don't love it either, but <laughs> so general. But just start by giving us an overview of, you know, when you hear that term, what patellofemoral or PFP pain is and why someone might suffer from it. Yeah, for sure. I, um, I don't hate the term, you know, and I think in some ways physical therapy is moving that way. So like another term that's kind of got roasted over the past couple of years is like shoulder impingement, or subacromial oh, yeah. impingement syndrome. And I think there's a, a few reasons that are good why it's gotten roasted a bit, but in some ways it's gone a little bit far. You know, it's like at the end of the day, what do you want to call your shoulder pain, right? Or what do right. you want to call your knee pain? Um, at least for me, patellofemoral pain is just anterior knee pain. It's some sort of issue that's probably originating underneath the kneecap. I think to this day, we don't know what generates that pain, what's providing nociception and, and nociception or for the listeners never heard of this before, but you have these little sensors within your body and they just basically relay information up to your spinal cord and your brain about what potentially would be causing an injury or dangerous, right? And then your brain decides to produce pain. And when it produces pain, it doesn't send it back to your knee. It actually produces it to a spot in your brain. So a lot of this is not super accurate to like, oh God, underside of my kneecap, this is the exact area that's maybe causing this, right? And we don't right. know what is providing that nociception it might be the bone. There's a lot of folks that suspect it's one of the fat pads in that area. Right. So I think that's one of the reasons why it catches this heat of like, you know, this is a junk term, right? We don't, you know, it's not specific to what's actually causing the problem, you know, sure. but I think it kind of masquerades as anything that is pain underneath the kneecap. Um, that's not really, um, more tendinous in nature. So let's say quad or, you know, patellar tendinopathy, anything within the tibial femoral joint, whether that's meniscus, cartilage related, um, let's say any of the, the CL ligaments, MCL, LCL, ACL, PCL, anterior knee pain. It's the most common type of pain. Um, generally speaking, it hurts when you squat, hurts when you go downstairs. It's very common in youth athletics, right? Yep. Um, it's, it's quite benign in the sense that there's nothing more serious going on. 
but it's also quite interesting in the sense that, you know, we spoke about this before, it tends not to go away in most folks unless there's some sort of intervention. And the research is pretty clear on this. You know, it, it's, it's funny because you can be like a 13 year old with knee pain, right? Yeah. And it just doesn't go away yes. with a lot of rest. And that's weird, right? So why does that happen? Um, but the research is pretty clear. If you don't intervene on it, it tends to kind of stick around over the course of time. So it's an intervention that does really well by stressing it, right? And kind of dosing the stress. Um, and a lot of this cool research has come from Michael Rathliff. Um, and he also has done a lot of research on Osgood Schlatter's, which is another really common one in youth, right? So essentially, if you have someone that has patellofemoral pain or Osgood Schlatter's, if you just blow through their pain, right? And I think you can probably lump patellar tendinopathy into this. I know you've worked with a lot of folks with this issue. Oftentimes it gets worse, right? Yeah. It's one of those things that kind of sticks around throughout the course of the season. Uh, sometimes it gets worse. It's really tough when an athlete comes in mid-season with this problem, right? Yes. Like, oh God, let's let's hope for the best. Sometimes they get worse, sometimes they get better. Um, so <clears throat> best case scenario, if you can, is to typically unload these folks a little bit. And I don't know if I even like the term unload so much because we actually add more stress to these folks when they come through the door. I want to exercise them more, yeah. but what I want to do is decrease the intensity, right? Okay. So you take them down to a point where their pain is less than I say about a four out of 10, right? right. And this is for all of your activities. So that might be running, jumping, cutting, playing your sport, sport specific drills. It's also training in the gym. So I essentially look at their program and I try to figure out which movements feel good, which don't. And the ones that are kind of above that about four out of 10, um, and another caveat is that the next day you should feel back to your baseline. For a lot of folks, they feel fine when they exercise, but they feel God awful the next few days. Yep. So if that's you. You have to make some decisions about what you're doing in those days prior and try to figure out what was what was cause, causing that. But we take all the activities within their sport, within the gym, and also activities in your lifestyle. So for some of these folks, they just can't sit. They can't sit with their knee bent for a long period of time. So they need to do more standing or they need to prop up their heel when they are sitting. So they're not aggravating it during their daily lifestyle. Right. right. And that's kind of step one. Um, and I think if you do this well, you're actually rehabbing someone. And I think this is, this is very much within the realm of what a strength coach or trainer does. It's like, Hey, let's stop doing things to aggravate it, but let's continue working towards your sport. Let's continue working towards your strength and fitness goals. So maybe they can still tolerate some deadlifting, maybe some squatting to a box, right? Maybe we're going from, lunges to single legged deadlifts for a little bit, but we're still training the quad and the hamstring with some isolation work, some calf exercises. So more or less they have a general strength and conditioning program that's respecting the knee. Yeah. Right. And on top of that, I try to add more exercise to the areas that we know help that pain problem. Right. Uh, patellofemoral pain is interesting because we know that hip strengthening actually is something that decreases patellofemoral pain. Uh, but the other piece is that I wouldn't ignore the quad. And we do have research that shows that when you combine quad with hip, our outcomes are a little bit better. Yep. So from the get-go, I'm adding a lot of hip strengthening because I know it's going to be tolerated pretty well in most folks. It's pretty odd if someone has patellofemoral pain and you give them like, you know, mini band sidesteps and it's killing their knee. <laughs> that's odd. You know, yeah. you can strength train the crap out of that hip and that's going to help them reduce their pain. And as they can tolerate more quad stuff, and in the beginning, maybe they can't. Maybe it's really flared up and you can't really strength train the quad. Uh, we back off of that. But as they can start to tolerate it, we start to put more quad exercise in there. And that's with isolation exercises. So think like knee extensions, sissy squats, right? Any way you can get away with kind of isolating the quad without causing too much irritation. Um, but we start to incorporate compound exercises as soon as we can. So let's say you're, you're starting with a, a barbell back squat, sitting really far back to a box. As they can tolerate it, we start to sit more upright. As they can tolerate that more, we start descending a bit deeper, right? Yep. Maybe start incorporating some of those single-legged exercises that we stopped for a little bit. So let's say step-up variations, lunge variations, come back in the mix as people can tolerate it based on those pain guidelines. Feels okay during, feels okay the next day. And really just slowly incorporate more over the course of time. Um, so as, as people are starting to tolerate, let's say, strength exercise in the gym, I'm starting to think about, hey, you want to get back to running, let's start to incorporate some more running. And the running goes the same way. We start to incorporate a little bit of volume, see how they handle that. We extend the volume out over the course of time. As that starts to feel good, we increase the intensity. And there's like a myriad of ways you can do that, right, from a programming mm -hmm. perspective. But those those are kind of like the, the basic principles, right? And what's kind of cool is that as a good strength and conditioning coach, you're going to do this naturally, right? But that's literally my treatment plan as a physical therapist. Right. So um, when I think about someone like yourself or I work with Tony a lot, you know, and all the trainers at um, Champion PT and Performance, like 
a lot of what we're doing is very, very similar at the end of the day. And like, I'm not, <clears throat> you know, I had a, a coach come to me the other day and he was asking me questions that were kind of in the weeds about pain programs. And every once in a while, you'll have a patient that kind of skips PT and goes straight into like training after major surgery. Like we had another right. patient that tried to skip all their physical therapy and go straight back to training after spinal fusion surgery. And I'm like, no, Whoa. that's not, yeah. <laughs> that's not, not the a good job idea. of the coach. Right. So I do think that it's important that the physical therapist is going to be taking the lead, um, you know, for, for these pain problems. But I think at the end of the day, what we do is very similar, right. As long as you're being smart and you understand some of these principles. So very cool. Yeah. Well, one thing I love that you touched on too, and, you know, if I can raise my hand and admit failure in some areas, it's like, I think the young meathead power lifter in me definitely shied away from any sort of isolation work. And it's funny, I think it was actually Mike Reinhold uh, was on a while back and we got, you know, talking about this. And I know I've talked about it with other strength coaches that I respect. Chris Chase has talked about it. But like, man, I, I really think it's not the be all end all, right? Like a leg extension or a leg curl or an, a seated calf raise. They're not the be all end all, but they, they can play a helpful role in restoring function and getting people back into whatever activities they enjoy in life. Right. I agree so much. It's, it's actually kind of funny because I don't know. I was, I, it's funny. Because it, I don't even know why this was, but at least during my upbringing in the strength conditioning world, it's like when you're in the gym, your heel stays down. Yeah. You never, ever lift your heel right yeah. and people kind of hate calf raises in general you know it's like if you were into bodybuilding maybe you would do some calf raises but right. for an athlete like we're not hips a powerhouse dude what are you doing keep right. that heel down right to the point where like my calves i have like so much trouble with like calf strain injuries <laughs> achilles problems now yeah like the, the pendulum just swung for me because yeah. When you start looking at physical therapy research, like most of the research is on isolation exercises, they just tend to work well. And if you have a weak link in your chain, right, that's probably the area that's going to get hurt. And if yeah. all you do is train your hip and your calf is forced to do some work and it doesn't like it, or it's not prepared for it, like, yeah, it's going to get hurt, right? So it, funny. It, it's common sense, but uh, I actually had Jared Antflick, who's like a really high level tenon expert on last week. And we had the same discussion. He's like, so much of my tendon loading protocols are basic strength and conditioning, right? Like make sure there's no weak areas, uh, train all the big, big muscles, train all ar around the big joints, periodized program, right? It's like, sometimes I think we just make it so difficult when it's like, hey man, let's just go back to the basics that we know work. Yeah, I find that too. I, I think there's so much to be said. You know, I, I look at, you know, folks like you, folks like Mike Reinold, right, who've, who've been around for a long period of time. And I, I think what happens is people kind of get lost in the new fancy things that are happening. And then then they develop this weird sense of elitism, like, oh, my gosh, you're not doing this technique. Like, are you a good physical therapist? They lose respect. Right. I just find myself over the course of time going back to the basics over and over again. It just seem to work so well. The problem is that they're not sexy, right? Yes. And you want to get that as a, a, a learner, you want that stimulation of like, oh, I want to do these minutia things, which is going to make this huge change. In, in some ways, I think it can kind of unlock your next level treatment, but more and more I find myself going back to like, all right, what are the big things I can manipulate? That didn't work. How do I go back to the basics and change these, you know, pieces that have a, a large impact, but they're they're simple or they're basic. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, there's a ton of fruit that can be, you know, harvested, I guess. Yes. Uh, from the basics before you go into like these minutia things. And I think sometimes you're going down a pathway that's not serving the person in front of you, you know, just because you might have this sense of like, I need to do this thing. Which maybe you do, but a lot of times you don't, sure. I don't think. Sure. All right. So I want to bring this full circle. When you're dealing with a client or athlete who has had painful episodes in the gym, how do you help them learn from these issues? And just as a general rule, become smarter about their training in the future. Yeah, I think a lot of ways time does this to folks, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I always tell people that pain is a great educator. It's a great professor, right? You learn so much every time you get hurt, right? Yep. And I think for a lot of folks as they age, pain just wins and it's unfortunate. Like I, I can't tell you the amount of people told me like I had this old groin injury and I just don't run anymore, right? Yep. Or I change from this sport to this sport because I can't handle it anymore, right? Yep. And I don't think that's great. 
you know, can you play tackle football when you're 60 years old? Yeah, maybe. But at the end of the day, it's like you're expecting a little much from your body. Right. You know? Um, but I do think that it's a great opportunity when people have pain and just get them to reflect on maybe why they had pain and some of the things they can do in the future to maybe avoid this. And that's hard. Um, I always think that physical therapy as a profession is hilarious just because like when people are hurt, we're like the most important people in the world. Right. Yeah. When people aren't hurt, like you're a dumb profession. Like people don't like you. Ever, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I, there's something to human nature that just like, we kind of forget these things, you know? Um, but at least just getting people to start thinking about why they got hurt, how they got hurt, and then how they can change in the future. Um, but just guiding them along the way so they don't have these major swings of like, oh, I hurt my groin and like, I'll never be able to exercise ever again. You know, and that we know that's wrong too, right. right? I can't think of very few situations where people can't get back to at least in some resemblance of, you know, back to a given activity or a sport, right? Um, so just being reasonable with your expectations, right? I think Tony Genelcourt yeah. talks about that a lot. It's like, dude, you're 40, dude, you're 50, you know, like you're trying to get back to something that's not realistic. Right. Right. Um, in some ways you have to respect that because bodies do age. And as much as like the youngsters don't like to think about it, like as you age, things do change a little bit. Yep. Um, and I think as you age, you gain appreciation for that. Like 20 year old Dan understood that principle 100%, but I didn't truly comprehend it or like make it a big part of my training or other people's trainings just because I didn't experience it myself. Sure. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of folks, they won't actually get it until it happens to them. So yeah, just trying to get them to guide them through the process once it does occur and then make smart decisions in the future, you know, and just keep in mind, this is for a lot of younger athletes, their first injury is very interesting, right? Yeah. It's like, it's the first time their body just kind of failed on them yep. and they just don't get it. They don't understand it. Yeah. We have a few very seasoned athletes currently at let's say a champion that have had like multiple surgeries and they get multiple injuries and it happens all the time. And they just understand that that's part of their sport. They have good people that can help them through the process. And that's that it's okay. And a lot of folks their first injuries could be career ending, not because it's that severe. It's just because it, it just dominates them psychologically. Right. Yeah. So just helping to guide people through that process and get them to make good decisions and just have them, you know, to the best of your abilities, not kill them, right. End their career, you yeah. know, make them make better decisions. If you can gently lead them along the right path. Love, so. it. Love it, man. Okay, big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Dan Pope one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, gosh, man. That's good stuff. Uh, I don't even think I would take this advice, and I think it goes back to my earlier point, right? It's like <laughs> you don't really get this until you actually experience it for yourself. But I think being a little bit more open-minded earlier on right, is very, very important. Yep. Um, I just didn't take advice, right? And I think that that's a big part of being young is that, you know, and I see this around me all the time and I try to have grace for it. You may have someone that's in the gym that's trying to do like 17 programs at the same time. They're jumping from activity to activity and you keep telling them like, dude, this is it's not good. This is not smart, right? But right. I did the same exact thing and I actually had some people in my ear tell me not to and I didn't listen, right? Yep. So I, I would probably tell, you know, former Dan, the same thing, like make sure you listen, be more open-minded. This stuff is very important, but I think at the end of the day, it, it's, it's a learning experience, right? Okay. But the faster you can get that through your, your brain. And I see some young professionals that do a great job of this where I don't think that I did, um, better, right? So I would, I'd probably give myself that advice, be open-minded, listen to people around you that have the experience that you don't, right? Uh, and I think the other piece of advice is seek out more mentors earlier on hmm, and I don't like repeat the same mistakes. Yeah. Cause I, I had mentors too. And I, I, still ended up not taking their advice because I didn't believe it. Right. Mm -hmm. And eventually I was like, ah, they were right. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, wow, should have listened to them earlier on. So. Well, I think taking some, taking some L's along the way, right. Having a couple losses in the win loss column humbles you pretty quickly. And if you're willing to reflect on those and say, mm, nope, this one's on me. You know, like other people said, don't do this. Or other people suggested doing something else. And I went, and did my own thing. Hey, man, sometimes if you're willing to humble yourself and learn from those losses, they can be really powerful. You're totally right. If you get punched in the face a few times, you learn. You know <laughs> yes. what I mean? Um, hopefully you do learn. You know, it's, you know, I've been punched in the face more often than I'd like to because I haven't <laughs> listened. But that's a great way to teach folks. You know, I had, yeah. I had a... Uh, I had a mentor tell me this at one point. So he was a, a CrossFit gym owner and he has a lot of new coaches and he loves mentoring. He's a great coach, 
one of the things that he would have his newer coaches do is like come up with a game plan for the day, right? It's like, okay, you're going to go in, you're going to teach the group of people here, right? Yep. So coach go home and just write down what they're going to do with the warm up, how they're going to manage the class, like what the workout's going to look like. And uh, the person would come in, talk to like my old mentor and say, I'm going to do these things, right? And the coach would maybe give a little bit of feedback, but not much because if there was going to be some failure in there, kind of wanted that. Yeah. Wants the coach to feel that because yep. that's a good way to learn. Because if you go in there and you're like, I'm going to do this entire warm up and it takes 30 minutes and the workout takes 45 minutes, you're going to have a really good learning experience, right? right? So getting those L's, like you said, is actually pretty dang valuable. <clears throat> yep. I love it. Okay, man. Last but not least, lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. Number one, we talked about CrossFit a couple times. What were some of your biggest takeaways from your time as a CrossFit coach? Uh, two things. One, as a CrossFit coach, you have to get really good at coaching the lifts very quickly. Group environment, you only have a few seconds to make a change with someone. What yeah. are the cues that are most powerful, most effective, right? Also, you get a ton of reps in, right? So you're constantly looking at lots and lots of athletes. Personal training is a little more one-on-one, -on -one, which also has its benefits. But group setting classes where you're trying to teach a snatch to everyone, you know, yeah. you have 20 people learning snatch, you have to be very, very good at coaching very quickly. I think that was super helpful. The other piece is learning the power of a community. Uh, CrossFit is crazy. Say what you will about CrossFit. One of the things I think they did really well was cultivate a crazy, you know, passionate community around yes. fitness, which yes. I think is awesome. Yeah, right? They absolutely. did a really good job with that. So it really taught me the power of fitness, you know, in the group setting, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, number two, you mentioned this super early on, and I had to like dig this out of your bio somewhere. Man, talk to me about pole vault. How did you get into that? Weird sport. I yeah. always open up with, yeah, I used to pole vault. Have you ever heard of that before? <laughs> it's a weird thing where you grab a stick and you run down a runway and jam it into the ground and jump over a bar, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. It is weird, right? It's like, how does anyone start pole vaulting? Uh, I had a buddy that just told me he thought I'd be good at it because I kind of like gymnastics stuff. Okay. Um, so folks that have a really easy transition over to pole vaulting, uh, typically they're, they're fast people and they can jump, right? Yep. They have some upper body strength, but gymnastics is one of those things that really prepares you kind of like the aerial awareness, body awareness of being upside down, shooting yourself over a bar, having the confidence to do these crazy things. Yeah. Gymnasts are nuts. They're like some of the most fearless athletes that I've ever seen. Like you basically are going full send on every single, you know, movement you do yeah. trying to do something the body clearly is not supposed to do and hoping to God that like it <laughs> turns out okay. Right. Yeah. It reminds me of like motocross. Like you're just trying to do something that's incredibly dangerous. Right. And yeah. super technical. Uh, but I just had a buddy that told me that he thought I'd be decent at it and tried it. Um, I ended up being half decent at it. So I ended up going to Rutgers university for it um, and just did it for two years. Actually, I, I didn't want to do it. <clears throat> I ended up doing it. It was a great learning experience. Uh, I ended up kind of hurting myself and not enjoying it. So I just did it for two years, but um, it was definitely a cool experience. Yeah, so. that's awesome. Okay, number three, most impactful book you've read in the past one to two years? Yeah, for sure. This one's a really good one. Uh, I've had so many impactful books over the course of my lifespan that have made a huge change. Um, one of the people I've been listening to a lot recently, and I read their book, um, I own a business, right? So one of the things I feel very strongly about is people being able to sell themselves, at least in my field, right? I think yeah. in some fields, it's the opposite. They, they're a little too salesy, too, yeah. too markety, right? Yeah. Uh, but as physical therapists, we're confronted with a huge obstacle. So essentially, we graduate PT school, huge, at least nowadays, huge debt burdens, and our incomes don't match that. You can almost argue that university is is too expensive and doesn't deliver on the value that maybe it once did right so um, i think that physical therapists need to learn how to value themselves and also get kind of compensated for that and that's going to take some um, information learning that revolves around things like marketing and sales um, and i've read a hundred million dollar offer by alex ramosi recently okay have you heard of that guy at all i have i don't know much about him but i have heard of him He's a little bit newer on this scene in terms of sales and marketing. Um, and I just vibe with him a lot because he kind of grew himself in the fitness world. Yeah. So essentially, he was kind of the meathead that we all wanted to be growing up, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, had a very successful gym and gym law business. And then, like, he kind of turned that into acquisition.com. So he basically kind of guides other companies to grow. 
And uh, he has a really good book called $100 Million Offer. And to be honest, I don't think that's going to be the best book for people to read when they're starting to learn about marketing and sales. Right. But it's been super helpful for me because I have an established business. Uh-huh. And I'm trying to push that over the course of time. And um, it's had an enormous impact on me, at least. So definitely worth a read for established businesses, I'd say. Uh, maybe not the best read for kind of newer clinicians or you know newer physical therapist trainers or learning how to market themselves a little bit more so. No, I'm going to have to check that out. That sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> okay. Last Good stuff, but, yeah. Yeah. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Dan Pope, man? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? Yeah. So early in my career, I, I was hell-bent on trying to be the best uh, clinician, coach I possibly can be, and I still am. And I love learning. I love sharing. Uh, a lot of that has changed over the past few years because I have fitnesspainfree.com, and, and Fitness Pain Free has been around for over 10 years at this point, but um, I'm trying to be the best um, mentor I can possibly be. I'm trying to help other coaches and clinicians be better, right? Yep. So that's been a major shift in my own career over the past few years. I've always loved it, but now it's just becoming a bigger part of my my day to day, right? Yep. So I'm, I treat a few less patients and I spend more time and effort trying to help other coaches and clinicians. So I want to be the best I can at helping other folks. So constantly I'm obsessive about it. I'm trying to help people as best I can. I'm trying to learn about all the pain problems that folks like myself kind of experience on a regular basis. How can I help those folks? So um, if I can help anyone listening to this, I'd love to hear about how I can. And I have my own podcast. I have all sorts of social media. So I'm going to be trying to do that <laughs> to the best yeah. of my ability. Yeah, you're prolific, dude. You are out there, man. I mean, Twitter, <laughs> IG, podcast, like you're doing the thing, man. I'm impressed. Uh, thank you. What's funny is that I have historically hated social media and I yeah. hear this story a lot. I think a lot of folks like you or me and Brett Contreras said this recently. It's like when this weird era where the best coaches in the world, right? You wouldn't know who they are. No. Essentially, they're not big on social media. They're spending all their time actually in the gym trying to be good. And back in the day, that's kind of how you got good. And it still is, right? It hasn't right. changed. And I think the unfortunate side effect is that the best coaches in the world are not really spreading the information because they're busy working and they hate this idea, right? <laughs> Essentially, they're like, you know, why is this person with one year experience who like does a hip thrust, right? Getting all this popularity when I did all the research, like Brett for years and years and years and developed all these principles and written the research, right? right. It's not fair. It isn't fair. It sucks. But that's the world we live in. And that was like a punch in the face. When I learned that, I'm like, I need to go all in on this because that's how you win and that's where we live now and that's how things are run. So I, I accepted that and I just put in a crazy amount of work, right? And yeah. I'm, I'm a nutcase, right? Mike Rhino tells me all the time, he's like, you do too much, give too much away. Like, <laughs> you know, that's just how I am, yeah. you know? And yeah. it, it's been working for me, so I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm not gonna stop and I love doing it. So that's another reason why I'm a nutcase, but you're right. I'm a psychopath and it's a lot, but it works and I, I love what I'm doing. So I'm going to keep doing it. Well, if it's any consolation, if you want the anti Mike Reinold, uh, Shantae Cofield, who uh, is amazing with, do you know Shantae or know of her? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Movement maestro. Love her. But her thing is, hey man, give it away. Give it away because if people like you and if they trust what you're saying, they're going to pay to hear you say it in a seminar, at a conference, in a cert, like if people vibe with you and they trust you and you know want to hear more from you, they're going to pay to hear it. So, Dan, this is this, Agreed. this has been awesome, man. Really appreciate your time. Uh, where can people find out more about you and all the great stuff you're doing? Yeah, I've had a great time too, Mike. I'm actually really pumped to be on this podcast. I remember one time years ago, I was I, my sister lives by Indiana, right? Yeah, and. Uh, I was like, man, I got to go visit Mike, right? And yeah. what's kind of cool is I was new and, and I really looked up to you at the time, still do. And it's just super humbling that now I, I'm on the, the platform that you've created is really cool and special to me. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, a lot of gratitude there. But fitnesspainfree.com is my business. I'm everywhere. So if you put fitnesspainfree.com into Google, you will find me. My website is my main hub. If you want to learn more from me, definitely sign up for the newsletter. I basically create a weekly newsletter that is the educational resource I wish I had when I kind of finished up with PT school and wanted to learn more. I definitely recommend checking that out. I put out a ton of content on YouTube, Instagram. I'm also on TikTok as well uh, and Facebook. I would say Instagram, YouTube are going to be the best, but definitely head to fitnesspainfree.com, sign up for the newsletter, and then follow me on YouTube and Instagram. Perfect. I'll make sure I get all the links in the show notes. Haven't, haven't made it to the TikTok yet. 
I haven't gone that I'm far there. yet, but yeah, man. Like I said, you're well, doing the thing. I'm doing the thing. Like TikTok is the biggest social media platform, and I would argue that I'm not doing the best job on it, but I still post once a day, and it's pretty easy to just take all my shorts and, and reels and just replug them over to TikTok. So it's growing slowly. Um, yeah. It's another you know outlet. I think there's a ton of power there. So I mean, it's it's under tapped, right? Like you're one of the Absolutely. smartest folks I know in the world of strength and conditioning, and you're not on TikTok. Yeah. So. Anyone else that goes on TikTok and starts like pumping out good strength and conditioning content, they're probably right. going to explode. So. Yeah, I love it, man. Well, again, Dan, thank you so much for coming on, buddy. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode with Dan Pope. Really hope you enjoyed it. Like I said up top, just an incredibly practical episode. Dan is such a sharp guy, and I love his philosophy. I love his mindset because... Look, if you do this long enough, yourself, people you work with, injuries are going to crop up. So it's your choice. Are you just going to kind of sit at home and waller and just be upset? Or are you going to attack your rehab? Are you going to find ways to continue to train and use that injury as a learning point, as a tool to help you get better going forward? So love his philosophy, love this episode, and I really hope you enjoyed it as well, and hopefully took a few things away that you're going to be able to use going forward. So if you enjoyed this episode, please do me one small favor. If you are not already subscribed to the show, do that right now today. It's going to take all of two seconds out of your life, but wherever you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store, wherever you consume podcasts, go there right now, click on the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.